नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू इंडियन डिप्लोमेसी शो ऑन दूरदर्शन इंडिया नेशनल ब्रॉडकास्टर अबाउट इंडियन फॉरेन पॉलिसी इंडिया इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन हाउ इंडिया परस्यूज इट्स कोर नेशनल इंटरेस्ट वाइल ऑल्सो लुकिंग आउट फॉर द ग्लोबल पब्लिक गुड व्यूअर्स इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर टेकिंग अप द थीम ऑफ नाइन ईयर्स ऑफ प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी गुड गवर्नेंस विथ अ स्पेशल एम्फोसिस ऑन एनर्जी सिक्योरिटी एंड एनर्जी डिप्लोमेसी एनर्जी इज द लाइफ ब्लड ऑफ द वर्ल्ड्स मोस्ट पॉपुलर्स नेशन इंडिया which is of course also the fastest growing major economy and to secure energy energy supplies predictable stable energy this is a very very fundamental task of the nation and uh, spearheading it is none other than my guest in the studio today let me introduce you to him very esteemed uh, guest hardeep puri ji hardeep puri ji is a uh, union minister for petroleum and natural gas and concurrently minister of housing and urban affairs he is a long time uh, a diplomat uh, in, from the indian foreign service uh, for more than four decades he has served the nation with great distinction before becoming member of parliament and minister and uh, also an author uh, well known uh, books on uh, the united nations and on global politics uh, hardeep ji it's a great honor to have you here sir thank you very much for inviting me Hardeep ji uh, 9 years 2014 to 2023 we have seen monumental transformations under prime minister modi's leadership and uh, you have seen this you were earlier in civil aviation ministry now um, petroleum and natural gas and when you look at the energy scene in these last 9 years there have been major global changes and developments lot of volatility geopolitical fluctuations and yet india seems to be steadily making progress in securing these supplies for our vast and growing population and i'd like you to start with prime minister modi's overall guidance and leadership and the effect it has had on our energy security sir and what is it that he has brought to the table what is the mandate he has given you uh, in particular that you are able to navigate all these problems and provide for our people no i'm ha- happy to do so let me just uh, g- share with you one overriding um, thought i have is that 9 uh, years prior to what i call the modi era prior to 2014 the very people who are today hailing india's economic performance yeah. those who are talking about the indian decade i'm talking about morgan and stanley they had a characterization of india being part of the fragile five economies yeah. now that fragility um you know i'm in in other with other audiences i'll say you know when you are not sure about the um, endurability of contents then you put a label on that fragile handle with care to have come from that point of fragile 5 mm. not only to the fifth largest economy in the world today but in within kissing distance of becoming the fourth largest and the Sorry. third largest in terms of current performance and in terms of what is projected yeah i mean we ended the uh, previous uh, financial year at 7.2% rate of growth and the world bank i saw today is predicting india will grow at about 6.3 or 6.5% the next year now given the overall how did we get there mm. first and foremost i think uh, credit needs to be uh, uh, given uh, at the fact that we have a very different kind of political leadership today right. you have an office a person who served with great distinction as the chief minister of a an important state mm. which met many which during that period of his 12 13 years saw many challenges so he came on with ha- hands on experience then when he assumed responsibility there are many challenges which he had already conceptualized I mean on the urban side uh, you know previous governments thought that the urban space when the west called us reluctant urbanizers people said it's a nuisance the votes come from elsewhere you know a mindset was still conditioned mm. by rural development etc he embraced urbanization as an opportunity mm-hmm. in other words within the challenge he grasped the opportunity this one but coming to petroleum and natural gas you said something in your uh, preambular opening remarks about uh, energy being the lifeline of the indian economy it's a lifeline of the global economy Absolutely. but if you look at what's happening in the world today you will see i'm i'm simplifying it that the world consumes about 100 million barrels of 
oil in a crude oil in a day. Mm. India consumes about 5 million barrels, but the world is almost flat in terms of demand. World demand, even when things are good, was growing only at 1%. Mm. Today, you have question marks on how many of the larger economies, I mean, in terms of Arthvevasta, in terms of economic size, Germany, UK, France, there are even question marks about the US economy. Mm. I mean, I read the uh, Wall Street Journal recently, where several reasons, is the US going to head towards a recession. a recession? Several reasons why it will, several reasons why don't, in the end you don't know. I'm convinced the US will not. Mm. Then you have, if you define recession as quarter on quarter negative growth, Germany is self-declared in recession. The other economies in Europe are precariously yeah. balanced. India, on the other hand, even at the best of times, our growth is 3% yeah. uh, as against a global average of 1%. But I see India's growth growing even faster. Why? From 2014 to 2023, when you've moved from the 10th largest economy in the world to the 5th largest economy, your per capita income has doubled. And I said this and some educated uh, erstwhile colleagues didn't understand it. I am not saying that you're going to be a 27, 28 trillion dollar economy by 2040. I'm not saying it. I'm saying Ernest and Young is saying it. Yeah. Now, what you need to do is, what is a 27, 28 trillion dollar economy? And, and I'm not talking in terms of facts and figures. Somebody wrote a very interesting piece. Will we be a developed economy? It was in response to the Honorable Prime Minister saying, that in when we as an independent country, we will become a What is a Viksit desh? A developed country? Is there any definition on that? I have spent nearly four decades in multilateral dip diplomacy. I know there is a listing of 37 countries or maybe less who are characterized as least developed. Yeah. When they grow, they graduate, they cease to be least developed, they become developed Developing. countries. Similarly, developing countries, when they don't want to be classified as developing countries. Now here, wait a minute. Ours is a unique case. There are countries which are today 15, 16 trillion dollar economy, but they want to call themselves a developing country. Why? Because they think that there are some benefits, yeah. some benefits, some goodies out there, which will, some concession with, frankly, I think if you're a 15, 16 trillion dollar economy, your mindset should not be there at all. Yeah. It's the first time I come across a political leader who says I'm willing to renounce my developing country thing because I think by 24, and he's totally right. Mm. So if you look at the Ernest and Young prediction, it says by 2047, you will be a 27, 28 trillion dollar economy. Submission I make to you is, if from moving from the 10th position to the 5th position, your per capita income has doubled and you're still slightly less than 4 trillion dollar economy. Mm. If you go from 4 trillion to 10 trillion to 20 trillion and 27 trillion, how many times will your per capita income go up? it will go up at least six to eight times, yeah. okay? Uh -huh. These are all projections. And as guys talk about algebra and economics, I mean, they, are, they don't have the undergraduate economic student sense. When you are a $10 trillion economy, your per capita consumption mm. as a function of your per capita income goes up. A person who earns $10,000 per capita will not accept the kind of... Um, uh, you know, resources uh, or, or facilities you have available in Sector X. The beauty of India is that the Prime Minister was able to revamp the health sector mm. at the time of the pandemic when everything else was going around uh, wrong uh, uh, around us. We had a, a vaccine manufacturing capacity in the public sector between 2004 and 14. They dismantled it. I'm not going into the whys of it. Yeah. All I'm trying to tell you is starting from scratch, Domestic va vaccine manufacturing, you've distributed what? 220 crore plus. You've yeah. manufactured and distributed free. This is just one sector. And to over 100 countries. I'm coming to that. In my, my last uh, uh, association with the UN, so there are 193 countries in the world. South Sudan was 193 state. I was looking at the figure. What 100 countries have received vaccines from India. Mm. Some are part of commercial arrangements. The least developed poorer countries as part of bilateral assistance, etc. Look at it. Now let's move from health sector to connectivity, which I think is a very major indicator of whether a country is developed or not. Mm. Again, I'm not going into the debate. Today, there are very small countries which could be called city states, very high per capita income, but they still like to be called developing. Yeah. 
because they, they say they are part of an informal group in the GATT or the WTO. But here we are saying that we don't need that. We are going in that direction, mm. all right? Which means you're not, you're not saying no to multilateral financial uh, uh, processes or assistance, but we are saying we are developing this model on our own. Let me go to connectivity. You know, our airport privatization plans, it has unfolded, especially in the latest, without any support from the government. You've got a model, all right? We did well out of the, um, you know, Delhi um, uh, airport privatization in 2006 or 8, Mumbai, one was GVK, the other thing I was GMR, etc. And you got about 28,000 crores out of that, admittedly done. Then we used it to privatize. If you look at our airports, they're some of the best in the world. Yeah. Really. And if you look at air connectivity, you know, when I was civil aviation uh, minister, which I held from, I think, 2019 to 21, the worst period when the pandemic was in full force, you had to fly in 1,500 tons of medical equipment, one day Bharat one day flights, Bharat God knows how many people we, you know, three crore or so many people we repatriated, brought them back. You made 74 airports between before 2014. Today you made another, in nine years you made another 74. And I saw my colleague Mr. Sindhya's uh, statement in such some interaction, he said, within five years, you'll have a total of 200. In other words, not 148, wow. 200, 220 airports, heliport, etc. Look, it's a country on the move. Yeah. Why does this happen? It happens because you have a hands-on prime minister who takes a monthly meeting called Pragati. I don't know whether you're aware yes, of it. Yes, yes, yes. You are, you are aware of it. He personally reviews that sector. Yeah. I sat through a uh, review meeting with him when he looked at the uh, what's happening in the oil and gas sector. Uh, he wants to review. Now, if you have political commitment mm. and dedication at the apex of the system, everybody else is on call. I mean, you get some things done well, some things get delayed because ultimately you're the largest democracy. I mean, if you were not a democracy, I'm now going into another debate, yes. you know, people would not be able to hurl the kind of... Uh, uh, vicious uh, <laughs> stuff at you and yet so whether it comes to acquisition of land for projects whether it comes to development schemes the facts speak for themselves and I think these nine years have been unlike any other ten years or anything earlier and my concluding comment is you know in the year 1700 or thereabouts the Mughal Empire had designated some of our uh, local states as Jagat states what does it mean bankers of the world why? Because their resources were bigger than the uh, economy of the, of the United Kingdom as, as then. Mm. And they were constantly borrowing from these guys till we got into, you know, colonial, uh, co yeah. colonial 190 years of colonialism, where from a contribution of 25% to the global GDP, you went down to single digit or in single 2 or 3% in 1947. You're lifting that up and say if by... I mean, 2047 is I would say this $10 trillion economy will come much before that and, and, and $20 trillion economy. But you are surely on the path which has been set out of becoming a Vixit it's, Desh by then. It's indeed a historic era, Ardeep ji is saying. And I think uh, most people of India and most uh, sane observers around the world would also agree. Uh, Ardeep ji, yes, we are on the trajectory, upward trajectory, no doubt about it. Now, coming to the energy part. Uh, you have defined energy security and I quote, availability, supply, predictability, stability and affordability. Now, given this rising consumption levels that you just projected, uh, what is our strategy and roadmap and what exactly have we done in the last nine years and what is going to happen in the coming decade where we are very much hopeful that Modi's leadership is going to take the country further? See, what you described, I call that a trilemma. Availability. We are a large country, you can't afford any gap or shortfall in supply because the consequences, you know, we are a very, we are also a very voluble, uh, you know, raucous democracy, you know, there'll be a lot of noise. Affordability, prices mm. haven't gone up for one year and sustainability. Now, on the availability, there are two issues. One is our domestic ENP has to go up. But here, yeah, the gestation periods are very long. The decisions that we started taking, Modi ji assumed responsibility in 2014. From about 2018, steps started taking place. We are seeing the results now. Mm. Gas, pro gas production has gone up by 18% last year, 18% this year. ENP, you know, why would anybody come and 
invest in your exploration and production if your psychology is ki acha tum apna paisa lagao invest karo when we find the oil wo to hamara economic nationalism so we you are incentivize yeah. no 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 first of all if you have a total sedimentary basin of 3.5 million square kilometers most of it was closed so 1 million square kilometers has been opened up to for prospecting exploration. Yeah. for exploration number mm. one number two data now we've got got the data put it into a data repository available to everybody and the mindset is changed please come and explore if you don't want to use your own resources we will in fact incentivize you to do it all that is beginning to now pay this thing but meanwhile none of our increased consumption or increased requirement mm. in the midst of increasing refining capacity from 252 million metric tons per annum i think we are already up to 310 320 already plans but we want to take it up to 450 million metric tons per annum none of this is being allowed to undermine the sustainability mm. the green transition again give me three three quick uh, comment biofuels ethanol with the best will in the world the government before 2014 couldn't take it up beyond 1.4% biofuel mixing they had that blending goal since 2003 or something I, but they I was not part of it i was ambassador to brazil nothing concrete nothing could be happened achieved. because this, the policy mix wasn't there mm. up to 2014 only 1.4 along came modi ji defined 10% target by november 22 it was on 5 months in advance target of 20% biofuel blending by 2030 we brought it to 2025 You know how much money we saved by way of uh, import bill on 10% blending, 40,000 or 41,000 crores, oh. and we were able to pay our farmers 42,500 crores. I am very fond of giving two statistics uh, lately. One percent of sustainable aviation fuel. Mm. I, we just had one flight coming from Pune, but if we make that the norm, you will require 14 crore liters additional of. ethanol now we are wow. already going towards 20% blending we have already in april introduced something called an e20 a 20% blended fuel i thought it was available in 100 petrol bunks it's available in 600 and i'm told wow. it will be available in 1000 so you will have 20% blending by 2025 now wow and, and renewables also sir no no i'm coming 50%. compressed biogas yeah. compressed yeah. biogas we have a second generation uh, plant making uh, ethanol from agricultural waste in panipat if i remember correctly and uh, we've got two second generation third generation plants uh, agricultural waste bamboo so this is a country on the move mm. without the increase in consumption now somebody asked me the other day how can you make ethanol more thing as a first of all people you know sugar prices go up and down yeah now if the sugar mills get more feed plus we are using other diversifying the feed you know broken agricultural uh, uh, you know rice husk grain agricultural waste uh, bamboo you diversify your agriculture gets an opportunity arising out of that mm. and i think the good news is that the story is spreading now mm. the story across is across the country yeah okay. now the more people come one state came to me you know we don't have anything else you given us only 17 lakh liters there they said one we gave them 34 lakh liters now you tie up and states that that are slightly slow we'll give it to somebody else you see you can't make ethanol in chennai and use it in haryana mm. you you have to if you are making the ethanol in haryana you use it in haryana or in the uh, near vicinity right, i think sir. all compressed biogas gobardhan scheme they're all on the move sir um let me now take you to the diplomacy part uh, you have said that uh we need a more comprehensive and intensified engagement with all countries in sector of energy including russia and this uh, has become a so called controversy since the you know russian war in ukraine and i would like you to tell the audiences how we have defied uh, you know calls and pressures from various sides you've said that uh, you know pressure if your if your mindset is wired not to take pressure we don't take pressure so what is it about pm modi and modi sarkar and you the way you have been able to you know counter punch uh, i asked dr jay shankar on this show as well about this uh, and um, why is it that we have stuck stuck to our ground you have in fact even made a moral case for buying oil from any any source because we are still dependent on imports at present so uh, i'd like you to tell us why is what what gives us spine sir in our energy diplomacy first of all 
let me uh, demystify this. We started diversifying the sources of supply for many years. Mm. We used to import from a total of 27 countries. I think we are importing from 39 countries now, number one. Mm. Number two, the world is changing. For instance, we did not buy more than 0.2% of our requirement from the Russian Federation when we ended fiscal year uh, 31st March 2022. Right. And those military operations began on, I think, 24th February. So by that time, we were only buying that. Suddenly after that, we bought more. Then some other supplier came in, uh, sold us more. Look, if we were buying, let's say, ballpark figure, 5 million barrels of crude oil for consumption every day, mm. we had about 6 or 7 suppliers roughly giving us 800,000 barrels, etc. Start with, I don't see somebody who's a leader. I've now, I mean, I spent uh, 39, 40 years in the foreign service. Yeah. I've worked with many prime ministers. Yes. I've met other global leaders when we were presiding over the Security Council. First of all, the man, not the prime minister, but the man. I don't think anyone anywhere in the world is in a position to subject him to pressure. Because I don't think he's wired like that. I've been saying that for a long time. And if the leader is clear, I mean, I'm very clear in my mind, mm. provided my this thing is clear, who in a democracy, whom is your primary responsibility and duty to? My submission is to your Citizens. consumer. Absolutely. If I go to my consumer and tell my consumer that, bhai, wo aisa hai, thodi si stiti badal gai hai, antarashtriya stiti mein badlaav a gaya, ab petrol jo hai, 80 rupay pa nahi milega, ab 150-200 rupay pa, he'll look at you on the face, and he'll say, you are incompetent, you don't know your job. Mm. People expect, but, yeah. No, no. So, first of all, since April of next year, prices have not gone up in India. 2022, yeah. 2022, say 2023, April of last year, we are now in the middle of June, prices have not gone up. So, even those people who are talking about rising prices, I submit to you, sir, they are philosophizing with a false conscience. Mm -hmm. If you look at the prices anywhere in the world, India is amongst Absolutely. the lowest, number one. I'm not including those who are big energy producers. Now, if you produce made oil, you can't make it cheaper because it's in your backyard. But more than that, how did we get this uh, hold on prices? International grass prices of what is called the Saudi CP mm. went up 236 or 300%. We only allowed the increase to take place up to 60, 70%. Then what happened in terms of um, prices? A, OMCs are good corporate citizens, full marks to them. When they saw international prices shooting, they could have easily said, yeah, we have to make our profit. We will also yeah. increase the prices. They held back. There were under recoveries. They lost money on gas. By the way, collectively, they claimed they lost 28,000 crores. We, we compensated yeah. them for 22,000 yeah. crores. It's not that we don't know that they're losing money. So they lost money and they still held back. But on top of that, the Honorable Prime Minister reduced the excise duty on two occasions. Mm. One, in November of 21, 2021 and in May of 2022, I think cumulatively the cost, the price of diesel, uh, petrol and diesel came down by 6 rupees and 13 rupees collectively. And then the BJP states reduced their VAT. Mm -hmm. Now, why I'm saying they're philosophizing with a false concept? Look at the people who didn't do it. The talk about rising prices invariably comes from those who practice freebie politics, then don't want to reduce their price or raise it. Now, I don't want to belabor a point. You know, this is a, uh, a revenue raising uh, thing with the states. But then let's all look each other in the eye uh, and at least ensure that we are talking on the same. Uh, so you have even written a book called Delusional Politics and you have uh, found the malady uh, uh, in very co many countries and we are seeing some of it in our states as well. Um, coming to the OPEC uh, cartel and the group, I mean, you have been dealing extensively negotiating with them. And uh, while Russia's share has grown, uh, there are still important players in the West Asia, Middle East region who continue to be major uh, suppliers for us. And you have said that you would want them uh, to have a sense of calm, predictability, and realism in the energy market to make it more affordable for consumers. We have been uh, pushing them for what we call responsible pricing for a long time. But OPEC seems to have its own logic, and you know, often they resort to production cuts in order to raise the you know, prices. And even the US has been somewhat unsuccessful in persuading them. So how successful do you think we have been in getting across our point of view to them? Sir? My uh, starting point is, 
I think if you have a resource, energy, it's your sovereign decision how you want to price it. Of course. That's your decision. I think it will be wrong for me to come and say you are growing apples and sell them at this price. But I do say one thing to them and I've repeatedly said it and I've said it in the open. Make sure you don't have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. That as it is due to the pandemic, there was a lot of additional liquidity which went into the markets. This additional liquidity came in the form of the stimulus packages, etc. In India, we were very wise that we did it more in a more productive manner instead of injecting large amounts of cash in. So you already had inflationary pressures. You already have such inflation that if you have high oil prices in addition to that, yeah. it will move from inflation to the big R. So all that I've been telling people, including uh, to the OPEC plus major players and saying, please, they said, how do you think and when would it happen? One was very interesting conversation. Mm. I said, you know, if high oil prices, you know, there's been a changing narrative. When I was in um, Adipak, I think in um, Abu Dhabi, in, in, in the Abu UAE. Dhabi, yeah. it was in 21 October. I had mm. just become minister in July. Then they said, you know, by this first quarter of next year, or the, the, or the last quarter of this financial year, first quarter of next year, oil prices will come down. They didn't. Then mm -hmm. came 22, February 2022, then they said another. But the more interesting thing is, they've been cutting production, 1.6 million barrels in the last decision, 1 million. And the markets are... Uh, not responding, they continue to the, the no, price. There has, not to re there has to be a reason for that. It's below $80, yeah. No, today 72, Indian yeah. basket is 72. No, there has to be a reason. I don't speculate. I think two things have happened. One is that the expected revival in demand in some large economies is no, not no. taking place. Correct. That is one. But there's another reason. There's a lot of more oil coming in from the United States, from uh, mm. countries like Brazil, countries like Guyana. I don't know how much it is. But it's an interesting situation. Normally, somebody says it's a 1 million barrels a day uh, production cut is going to take place. The news should send the uh, prices, soaring, prices yeah, up. Yeah, yeah it doesn't up. happen. Yeah. So it means it means that some things that we say and do. Look, I am not quarrelling. If you are a producing country and you have your own economic requirement, you may want the price to be not at seventy but at eighty. That's your case. Mm. But on the other hand, if I am a consuming country, I have a simple. I detach myself from both my role as being associated with a consuming country and somebody else's role, who is associated with the produ producing country. I am not willing to believe that it is in one's interest to reduce production and raise prices and it's in the other's interest to. It's not even my interest for our oil prices to go down too low. Mm. Because then investments don't make any sense on that. Absolutely. Because I am both a consuming, importing country, I am also a producing country. If the price falls like when the economic uh, a lockdown took place, it came down to $19.56 a barrel. Nobody will invest in that. disastrous for investment. Uh, Sir, so on, on India being a producing country, I mean, this is of course on the anvil and it's the big, you know, future hope. Uh, you have said that we are expecting in 2023 alone uh, investments worth $58 billion in energy exploration and um, production in our country. Now, you have been meeting with leaders of big Western majors oil uh, giants, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, Total. What is the signal? What is What are you getting from them, sir? Signals. What are, what do they want from India? And why are they so gung-ho about India now, about investing in I, India now? I, I would be very careful in using words. I wouldn't say they're gung-ho. I think that we have got over a past situation where impediments were put in place consciously or unconsciously by the previous uh, dispensations, which were in the decision-making realm, of discouraging people. People mm. came and then they went away. Today, my narrative, the Honorable Prime Minister meets them, is very different. This is what we've done. Please let us know what more we need to do to tweak it to make it worthwhile for you. People are not going to come here to prospect for philanthropy, uh, to, phil uh, you know, uh, you know, to altruistic, be altruistic, yeah, yeah. Uh, altruistic or philanthropic purposes because they want you to become more energy. They will come, there's a money to be made. And Look, there are a total of four or five big players there. There are four or five big players here. Mm. They have to learn to interact. I'm very happy that all the companies you named and some others, they are in active negotiations. Some have operative MOUs. Some are coming in. And there's a by and large distribution of areas where they're going. Some of them are looking at the Andaman area. Some of them are looking elsewhere. 
and things are beginning to move. I think mm. that is the positive. So I don't use words like gango, but I think it's all a positive. Even our own initiatives, you know, uh, reforms in the gas uh, se sector, yeah. gas pricing. I mean, earlier you had a situation where it's going to be loss, loss for them. We looked at it. You were earlier determining gas pricing on four hubs. Okay, two of those hubs are not operational, and you were looking at the data once in a year, six months or so on, and you were using one-year-old data to do this. What we've done now is we do it now periodic reviews every month. That is 15 days we look at the data and mm. we have a floor and we have a ceiling and look at the results. The results are so if you have a government which is willing to work with the stakeholders in order to be able to make it worth their while, people will come people in. Will come. If you Record. look at where else in the world, green hydrogen is a case in point. Yes, Renew green motion. hydrogen. Green hydrogen will work in India because government is actively conceptualized an ecosystem which is designed to encourage it. First of all, green hydrogen will succeed where you have demand, mm. where you have a short consumption, okay, and where you have the capacity to produce. I am not willing to believe that in some desert 10, 15,000 kilometers away, you can make green hydrogen and transport it. It does not lend itself to that. So India, you have all three. Mm. And the government has given, uh, what, I think 19,700 under the PLI scheme for the manufacture of electrolyzers. Every electrolyzer manufacturer in the world is here today. Mm. Startups are working on it. But you have also demonstrated that the price of clean, green energy solar, you can bring it down from 25 cents to 3 cents. Per unit, yeah. Per unit. Once you can do that and you have water and you've got an electrolyzer, my friend, you've arrived. Absolutely. Sir, um now the question is, you've been also uh, advocating that India can be a big supporter and uh, can assist the energy needs not only of our own population but also of the global south. And you have said uh, multiple times that you know we would like to share our innovations and all these things in the energy sector, which are low cost and which can really benefit and bring about you know uh, large scale transformation in fellow developing countries. So on this uh, front, sir. Um, I would like to mention a couple of things for our viewers. One is the India-Bangladesh friendship pipeline that has been inaugurated. There's also India-Nepal petroleum pipeline and uh, hopefully many others that we are going to lay across our region for energy connectivity and uh, transborder trade and all these things. Now this is where as India's own production and refinery capacity and all these grow up, uh, uh, grow, I, I suppose we'll be able to do a lot more in terms of South-South cooperation. And in, on that front, India can also be a leader, sir. And what, is, what are your thoughts on, you've also mentioned that even at the G20, we can create large scale, you know, energy groupings uh, centered around the interests of the Global South, the voice of the Global South, you've addressed them, uh, energy ministers. So what is the signal you're getting from poorer countries and how are they looking up to India? Because traditional notion is India is a buyer of oil, India is a buyer of gas, India you know, itself is dependent on outsiders. But now we're trying to turn it around and say India can actually help others too in this field. So this is a big transformation. Sir. No, no, there are two or three separate processes. When you talk of the Global South, you have a much broader canvas in mind. When you talk about the Indo-Nepal pipeline, which when the Prime Minister of Nepal was here, we signed that. I exchanged an agreement with my counterpart from Nepal. Or you talk about Bangladesh. I mean, this is where energy will come in from a pipeline from us going into Nepal. There's already one pipeline. We had Sendikam two stations also. That's a very different kind of thing. Then you mentioned Bangladesh. But then, you know, uh, even where you don't have pipelines, like Sri Lanka, I mm. think we've given something like $4 billion of uh, credit in some form. I don't remember the exact That's figure. Right. After the financial exactly. crash. But today, India is not just oil and gas. Mm. I mean, there's something called Ujwala. You've given 9 crore, 60 lakhs Ujwala connections. I mean, at a time when, you know, what is, I was just now with the uh, executive director of the International Energy um, Agency, yeah. uh, Fati Birol, and he was saying that in his speech. What India has gone and done inside, you know, in the cooking um, uh, space, the where the most pollution takes place, where our mothers and sisters are uh, in the kitchen. That's one. But you've the, done solar, the solar. Th that's also. Yeah. But I mean, even Ujwala. Yeah. I mean, gas. The gas. I mean, we've got 14,000 kilometers of uh, pipeline in 2014. We're taking it up to 33,000. I mean, your gas uh, LPG connections were 14 uh, lakhs crores, and they are now 30. 32, 33, 32.8 uh, 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 lakh crores. Mm. So India's story is on a much broader canvas 
than uh, you know buying oil. Fossil fuels, no, yeah. first of all, our own oil. Look at your refining capacity. Mm. Refining capacity is 252 million metric tons. You're taking it up to 450. Somebody asked me this question the other day. But when we go away from fossil, no, your refineries will be making green hydrogen. But I think the real story is still to come. It is the green hydrogen fuel cell, because as mm. I said, if you bring down the cost of per unit of green uh, solar energy and you got electrolyzer and manufacturing here, you can deal with scale. So, last question. You've already spoken about the transition to green. Um, you've said that there are two worlds. There's the present world, the one which is still primarily dependent on fossil fuels, and then the, the world that is coming. And the bridge between this, this is the transition in the global scenario. India is rising at a time when this transition is happening. Your closing thoughts on how India is positioning itself as an energy power in the global order in this kind of transitional moment. I'll give you three things. One is not my assessment. BP Outlook, International Energy Agency, they are all saying between 2020 and 2040, whatever increase in demand is going to come globally, 25 percent is going to come from India. Mm. So my friend, all I'm telling you is, if 25 percent of the additional demand is going to come, you are already part of the uh, discussion. A big player, yeah. yeah. So if 25 percent of the additional demand is also going to come from India, you are there. Secondly, I think you have demonstrated your commitment to those Paris uh, uh, accord, goals, etc., yeah. etc. Et And everybody is today. What is the nature of the discussion? Yes, you got a net zero. Till 2070, 2070, but your major company is today. Two of them sitting there, OMCs, uh, Gale and Oil India. They have 2040 commitment, and IOCL has a 2046 commitment. Mm. Now everybody says you should do it quicker, but there are guys who have taken 2050 commitment when they should be able to do it by 2025. Yeah. So we are saying you also go forward, and then we will also come up. But that's I am not scoring points. I am saying India will ensure availability. Affordability and sustainability, because the world ultimately has to transition to green energy. Mm. It, 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 I think that's an imperative, but it cannot transition through what I call abrupt decisions. Say fossil fuels close one day. No, you have to accelerate. And I think the chairman, uh, the executive director of the IEA, made a very nice statement. Mm -hmm. He said that last year, because of the disruption in the war, Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine, last year was the fastest year in terms of. The last few, in terms of the acceleration of transition to green energy, and India is that story. So, viewers, uh, Hardeep Singh Puri ji is saying that India is on the move under Prime Minister Narendra Modi's leadership. There are major uh, changes that have happened, uh, structural transformations. So many uh, po old policies have been revamped, new policies have been brought in, and now we are. Uh, on the cusp of big change as a result of these transformations i want to thank uh, minister hardeep singh puri ji for sh sh uh, sharing valuable insights and for giving us confidence sir you have uh, served the nation with distinction both uh, as a career diplomat and now uh, in public life and in politics we would like you your mission to succeed because when your mission succeeds india rises to the top and uh, that is our sincere hope thank so, you so much thank for thank you very us. much for uh, inviting me and having this discussion and i said uh, this is the new india the rising india which is not only in the petroleum and natural gas sector but if you look at a host of other Across. sectors and i'm sure that when you uh, invite the line ministers there whether it's fintech uh, digital uh, inclusion you know schemes that everywhere the focus of the honorable prime minister is that those who are the most vulnerable in our society that they must be given the uh, 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 cover and the space Uh, for them to rise, with that India rises. Absolutely. There are already a lot, large number of multi-millionaires, billionaires. That's there are, and they will continue because it's a democracy, it's an open uh, economy. But when you have the base rising, as I said, if the per capita income goes up from uh, doubling to six times, see where India will be. See where India will be, uh, viewers. Uh, we are all waiting for that. Uh, the Modi era is still on and is going to continue, and we are going to see. massive uh, transformations in the years to come and uh, let's think about uh, energy transition global energy changes and india as an energy power i'll see you again next time until then take care